Hi, it's Kate, and this is the fifth video for Fortnite 7 of Math 23B. Well, here we go. We're going back and taking another look at limits and integration, but this time introducing Lebesgue integration in here as well. First off, we have a sequence of functions, f sub k. Uh, Paul here is using the general conversational term series, as in not an infinite sum. I'm being a little more specific so that you don't get confused with the mathematical definition. We have a sequence of functions, f sub k of x, that converge to a limit function, f, and we'd like to know that the limit, as k goes to infinity, of the integrals of f sub k of x, those guys in the sequence of functions, that the limit of those integral values is actually equal to the integral of the limit function itself. Now for Riemann integrals, we talked about this in the beginning. The hypotheses are a little bit strict. Each of the functions each of the f sub k's, we mean, have to be bounded. Um, they have to have a ball that contains the support of all of the f sub k's, and the f sub k's have to converge uniformly to that limit function. For Lebesgue integrals, though, the requirements are not quite so strict. Know that the convergence only has to be pointwise to the limit function. It doesn't have to be uniform. And the convergence only needs to occur sort of almost everywhere. So it can fail, but only on a set of measure zero but one or the other of the two additional requirements must be met. Let's introduce two major theorems that you'll be applying in this particular unit and how they work. First, there's the monotone convergence theorem. Now the monotone convergence theorem requires a few things. One is, is that if you take a look at the sequence of integrals of the f sub k's, that sequence has to have an upper bound. We're going to call it a. And in addition to that, for each x, if you took a look at the sequence of function values, the f sub k's of x, you know, f1 of x for this particular x, f2 of x for this particular x, f3 of x for this particular x, it should form an increasing sequence. That has to happen. So for most values of x, this sequence will be bounded, but on a set of measure 0, it may diverge to positive infinity. Now, if these requirements are met, then we can say that the limit as k goes to infinity of the value of the integral of f sub k of x is going to be equal to the integral of that limit function, f. And that value, the value of that integral, is a. Repeating that again, under these conditions, if you take a look at the limit as k goes to infinity of the integral values for f sub k of x, then that's going to be equal to the integral of the limit function, which is going to be equal to a. That's the upper bound when we were looking at the sequence of the integral values for the f sub k's. The second theorem is the dominated convergence theorem. So the requirements for this is that there must exist a Lebesgue integrable function, f, big F, that dominates the little f sub k's in the sequence. So in a sense that Take a look here, there are some typos that I will fix when I go back through here. Let's add a parentheses in here. Let's, there we go. Uh, when we look at the absolute value of the function values in any of the functions in the sequence, it's going to be less than or equal to the function value of, of big F. So for almost all X. Note that if those requirements are met, what do we have here? Well, if we take a look at the limit as K goes to infinity, of the value of the integral of f sub k of x, that's going to be equal to the integral of the limit function, and that's going to be less than or equal to the integral of that big F function that was dominating all of the f sub k's. So that's a pretty cool result as well. The key with both of these is really deciding whether the requirements have been met. They're not these major conclusions. They're not these astonishing, groundbreaking assumptions, you probably are looking at this and saying, yeah, that makes sense, and yeah, this makes sense as well, but the question is, when have the requirements been met in order for us to be able to make this conclusion? It's important to note that not every single improper integral as you're toying around with these is a Lebesgue integral. For instance, here we have an example of an improper integral. This integral is defined only as the sum of an alternating but conditionally convergent series and it's not a Lebesgue integral because when we take a look at the absolute value of sine x over x, when we take the integral of the absolute value of that, that is not finite. But when we allow it to alternate in sine, when we take a look at positive area versus negative area, that is finite. 
And last but not least, running through just some of the tools that we use with integrals when we're dealing with Lebesgue integrals. Now for Lebesgue integrals, even where you have an integram that's unbounded or it doesn't have bounded support, generally the standard theorems are gonna hold. They can be proven on them, like Fubini's theorem, integration by parts, change of variables. Um, they're not so bad. But note that those theorems don't always hold for improper integrals, and not every improper integral is a Lebesgue integral. What are some famous Lebesgue integrals? You may be asking yourself, or maybe I am just using this as a device to transition into the next topic. Okay, Gaussian integrals. When we're taking a look at an integral like this, it's well defined as a Lebesgue integral. But what's interesting is that A, this original integral, not able to compute it with a basic antiderivative. It doesn't have an elementary antiderivative. It's very challenging to write down. Well, quite frankly, you can't. There are a couple different ways that you can tackle it. One of them is to define it as a Lebesgue integral. So here we have a squared, which is when we take this and multiply it by itself. So here we have two identical single variable integrals. And then we can use Fubini's theorem and a change of variable for the Lebesgue integrals to combine them as such and then change into polar coordinates, and we can easily evaluate that. We only have one rather unpleasant improper integral right there on the inside with respect to r. And this evaluates nicely to pi. Since we've determined that a squared is equal to pi, we can find that a is equal to square root of pi. This is going to be your proof 20.3. What else? Well, there's also the gamma function defined for r greater than 0. Here it is. Instead of writing this integral a thousand times, we just call it gamma of r. And it's a generalization of the factorial function, but in terms of integration, with the following properties. That gamma of 1 is equal to 1, and gamma of r plus 1 is equal to r times gamma of r, if r is greater than 0. So it has this very cyclical nature that you see in factorials a lot. And for integers greater than 0, gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n factorial, and gamma of 1 half is equal to square root of pi. Some fun facts. You'll be using these uh, on your problem set in some of the small group problems. And it's important to note that in statistics, there are many important probability distributions involve random variables that are not bounded, and so these lead to integrals with infinite limits, which can be interpreted as Lebesgue integrals, and should be. I mean, generally, you don't end up computing very much of them by hand when you're actually in a statistics class because they already have the values of the various integrals uh, in tables and things like that. But here are some of the most well-known ones. One is the exponential function. We also have the standard normal distribution. You guys, very, all my students are really into that one because they think that this is how we curve all our classes. And <laughs> the gamma distribution as well. And so each of these, when they are integrated over these unbounded uh, intervals, they evaluate to 1. Last but not least, we're going to introduce taxicab coordinates. And they're similar in spirit to polar coordinates. Um, we call them taxicab coordinates because they kind of have a nice little parallel to riding in a taxi. Coordinate u is like the polar coordinate r. It's the total length of a cab ride to the origin so u is equal to x plus y, and coordinate v is kind of like the polar coordinate theta. Now note that I said kind of like, it's not exactly polar coordinates, hence why it's x plus y, and not the square root of x squared plus y squared, but you understand. Coordinate v is like polar coordinate theta. It's the fraction of the journey that's spent driving north-south. So when we look at the parameterization function that converts us from x, y to x in terms of u and v, and y in terms of u and v, here's what it looks like. And the determinant of the Jacobian is u. So we will have to substitute dx dy with u du dv. And taxicab coordinates are extremely useful because look at how nicely a sum of x and y simplifies, especially when you're using exponential functions. And of course, sort of looping back, taking a look at these gamma distributions, a famous application is to show that for the beta distribution, which does involve some of the gammas that we were talking about, we can really simplify this quite nicely. What would have been an overwhelming number of exponential functions can just be expressed as the integral from 0 to 1 of mu of x being equal to 1 once you simplify all of this down. 
there will be a problem where we go into this in much greater detail, both in lecture as well as in the small group problems. But these are all just examples where we end up using Lebesgue integrals without really even noticing, because many of you have encountered these types of probability distributions um, in the past in statistics classes without realizing that this is not Riemann integration that we're dealing with anymore. Instead, it is Lebesgue integration. If you have any questions, of course, don't hesitate to ask. Thanks, guys.